Okay, good morning everyone. Uh, welcome again to our um, September edition of our Alta meeting update. Hope everyone had a wonderful summer. Um, today is going to be a heavy agenda, a lot of um, presentations, so we're going to make a really great effort to kind of stick to some of the timelines. Um, and likely I'm going to probably break the first one, but hopefully it's going to happen. <laughs> Um, just to remind everyone, the meeting is recorded, so remember whatever you say is on tape. Um, so, with regard to the agenda, which is on my first slide, yeah, we have a full house. I'm going to again just give a brief introduction, just to remind everybody again, you know, where we started, what our focus is, and what we're trying to do, and then kind of give the group a more overall view of some of the next steps we are thinking of right now. Um, then we're going to get an update from Diana. She had done some very nice work on a host of JAPD. She Okay, so Angel is going to give us an update um, as to the status of the in vivo study. So, we're looking forward to hearing, hearing some of that. Um, then, Jean Fu is going to talk about some of the in vitro assays. He's done some combination studies. And then we'll get the full chemistry update from OACR and Charles River and then any you know, agenda items that we can discuss later on. So, again, wanted to just start off with this slide again. It's a good reminder. We just come back from the summer, so we probably likely forgot everything we did before it began. So as a reminder, just to let people know that, you know, our focus is going after a disease called JIPG, which is there's no really good therapy for it currently. Um, survival outcomes are really poor and radiation is first line of therapy. There is no real chemotherapeutics that are approved for this treatment. So you know, that really presents a huge opportunity. And so we have decided to take on this target R2, which is found to be mutated in um, the IPG patients. And this mutation also comes with this histone mutation. So you're going to see some of the strategies behind using combination with epigenetics. But it's important to bear in mind there is no good alto inhibitors out there for various reasons, lack of potency, selectivity, poor oral properties. But more important, a lot of kinase inhibitors usually have difficulty crossing the brain. And, you know, alto inhibitors are no different. So we are really in search of good CNS penetrant alto inhibitors that are well tolerated. Now you could see the last point, they're not well tolerated, a lot of the common ones aren't well tolerated, probably that's attributed to poor selectivity profile. So there's an opportunity here to really develop selective alto inhibitors and really adjust whether this is a path forward for treating these patients with a diet unmet need. Um, so I thought again, it was just good to remind the team and people who are new to some of these meetings one of the nice things about this project is that it's open science. We managed to actually leverage a lot of the expertise from, you know, people all around the world, the likes of Angel and Diane. So it's really important to actually keep in mind this strategy for really doing science. It could be a quick way to really expedite things. And so I wanted to remind people that when we embarked on this program, we started out with a lead compound from some efforts from S2C and other colleagues. They had this M4K1046, which was published in 2014. It was a potent ALK inhibitor. But one of the problems was it's poorly brain penetrant. And it was a patented compound by a group that was collaborating with them at the time. So that could actually be a problem in terms of us trying to develop a candidate like that for the IPG. So we did a little bit of that after getting the CTIP grant, which has been going for two years now. 
And uh, one of the nice things we did, you could see in the diagram, is we got rid of that amino group, which we think was you know, affecting a lot of the liver group penetration profile. And we installed this methyl group at the power position of the pyridum. And the nice thing is, the compound turned out to be very novel, had much better potency and selectivity. <coughs> it, uh, sorry, had much better selectivity. It was highly brain penetrant, good stability, and more importantly, it was already bioavailable. So this compound has actually been one of our favorite leads right now. Um, everybody has seen the profile of it. This is the candidate we are actually currently evaluating in, um, you know, in vivo. One of the things we were concerned about was the health profile, which is about eight, eight and a half. Um, so we did embark on some efforts to try to mitigate this health liability. So one of the first things we did was we started, hmm? yes. One of the first things we did is to see if we can attenuate the basicity of the amine, which is usually one of the culprits for herd. When we did that indeed, we got rid of the herd activity, but to the bottom of the slide you can't really see. But these compounds turn out to be now poorly overly bioavailable because they became so insoluble when we knock out that solubilizing group. The other strategy which we use, which was a concern, is whether or not we can replace that trimethoxy group and we did some efforts around that, and one of the groups that were beneficial in terms of retaining activity was this amide replacement. The compound actually eliminated the herbs by virtue of poly that added polarity. However, these compounds actually turned out to be a little bit more polar, and so we had issues of overall bioavailability. Again, we attributed to the poor permeability of some of these hydrogen one donors that's added. So one of the strategies we thought we'll do is just enalkylate the amine and see if that helps. And that did improve the overall profile, maintain the health properties. And one of the things we ended up compromising on is the low BBB, which is not surprising. So we, we ended up in this conundrum where we want compounds with clean herbs, good overall properties, and we still also want it to be highly brain penetrant come like those are two dichotomous properties that the target the target probably like um, you know, lipophilic stuff that actually leads to herd. If you actually add polar groups or leave it herd, you affect PDB. So we're trying to strike a nice compromise for these compounds. And you're gonna see from the short list of compounds you've considered some of the all encompassing features we're thinking of. So one of the most recent updates we had, I mean, many of you have seen the profiles for the four compounds, 209, 117, 2234, and 2236. And there was this compound that actually has very good properties across the DIPG lines, and you were kind of plagued by the fact that the herb profile was about two. So, but more and more as we think about it, we thought, you know what, the activity of this one across the APG line might be worth actually having a closer look. So we just recently got the pick and make sure we don't get any surprise. And, you know, it's good to know that the compound 2163 is highly bioavailable. It's about 95% have decent clearance. And the exposure was quite decent. But more importantly, brain penetration at four hours was about one and a half. Very, very good. So those are some of the features we're really looking for. So I thought I'd just present that update to you. Another piece of data that we've talked about that's really important also is, again, just keeping an eye out for protein binding. Sometimes that can actually impact some of your PK overall and exposure <coughs> properties in tissue. So I wanted to just Hi, Matt, go. This is Alex. Ha um, Hi, Alex. Sorry for being late. No problem. <laughs> okay, so one of the nice things to see is that at least the compounds are not overly highly protein bound. A lot of times some compounds are like 99.9 .9 and then we get truly concerned, but we're getting decent refractions from all of the lead compounds that we are considering right now. 2143, we added that one to the shortlist late, so that's still in progress. We'll be collecting some of that data later on. But all in all, I think they have decent um, you know, protein binding profile, you could see the amide, it's a little bit more polar, actually give more refraction to 009 and 117. A little bit more lipophilic, but we still have enough refraction based on the potency to kind of actually consider these interesting. So, we're quite happy to see that the protein binding numbers aren't that bad, they're quite favorable. So, again, this slide is more of a snapshot summary of some of the challenges that you're 
alluded to earlier, like, you know, it's about no hug and be, be, be. So we want to alleviate her, but we still want compounds to really get into the brain because one of the things we're made aware of is that the pun region where the tumor usually is have a very tight BBB barrier around it. So it's important to get high brain penetration if you like it to be efficacious. And so we kind of struggle a bit because we don't want to compromise on the ability of the compound to get into the tissue. This is the efficacy. So just keep an eye out. You could see that 209117163, excellent profile in terms of BBB. We're keeping an eye on the whole profile. We've actually gone and looked at a lot of kinase that have been advanced and you know, we felt like this might be a risk worth taking. It's something that we're actually looking at. That's why you see the dashboard has so many lead compounds in it. At the end of the day, in addition to these two properties, when we have talks to consider another thing. So when we get the all encompassing data, we'll see what, what the winning compound is at the end of the day. All right. Um, so just to remind people that, you know, even though there's not a lot of like immortalized yeah, pretty line. You know, we have a lot of primary lines working on and so we're learning a lot more about these lines and lead compounds were evaluated in two representative lines here. One line which we think and convince that it's really the um L2 dependent, which is the IPG twenty one line. But unfortunately it's one of the lines that doesn't graph well. Then we have things like zero zero seven which can graph as well but may not be as dependent. So we're kind of covering the basis here, but all in all, the compound actually has some in, in vitro activity in these lines. So that's important. That would be unfortunate if we have no activity in any DIPD line, then that would be a problem. So the other thing that we've also done, and it's something, we know that DIPG actually is a, um, is a multifaceted disease. I mean, R2 is just one mutation, but I alluded to how R2 is accompanied by um, histone mutations. And so we thought it's worth really looking at um, combination strategies for treating the IPG since if, you know, no probably one mechanism is actually going to solve all these patients' problems. So we started strategically looking at some compounds that might likely show synergism. And so I'm reminding you of some of the old data here for the first round of compounds that we did. We are taking the blueprint uh, PDGF alpha compound because that's usually um, amplification in PDGF alpha is usually associated with some of these uh, some of these patients who have DIPG. So and then you have this CNS penetrant PIC kinase mTOR inhibitor 084. And then we you know one of the pop we know a lot of HDAC inhibitors are very potent in DIPG line, but the overarching problem with them is a lot of them are CNS penetrant. And so if one could find CNS penetrant age that actually, you know, there might stand a chance of treating a disease like this that really is looking for treatment. So we dig into the literature, we start looking for CNS penetrant age that inhibitors and we actually found two of them. This is one of them we evaluated the last time. And in light of the age that mutation, I mean, this is not overly surprising. Not the age that the histone mutation, which is a lysine to a methionine. It's probably very similar to what acetylation does, that's inactivate that lysine. So we saw some hint of synergism with one of the first eight that another compound that's in the clinic is this BMI inhibitor, which is part of the PRC1 complex. We saw some additivity with that. And more recently, we did a second round. I mean, we were <clears throat> enticed by some of the data in the literature that easy H2 and possibly some of these ED inhibitors might show promise. Um, so we're really excited in t testing these compounds, but unfortunately, both the easiest and the ED inhibitors, when we tested them, they did nothing to the lines by themselves, and when we do the combination, we didn't see any added benefit, so that was unfortunate. So I think that, that angle of our um, combination doesn't seem as promising. However, there was another CNS penetrant HDAC inhibitor from a company called Forum, which was previously, they acquired a compound from a company called Mesogene, and they were in the clinic for both Alzheimer's and dementia. Um, and apparently that trial wasn't successful, but this is one of the most CNS penetrant HDAC inhibitors, and they haven't explored it in a disease area like DIPG. And I think that company had closed down about two years ago. So we were quite happy to see that of the second round of compound, even though the E didn't work, we saw some hint of promise in the other CNS penetrant HDAC inhibitor. 
particularly in the 36 line. The data was noisy in the 007, so we want to repeat that. But all in all, I think it's trending towards the fact that these aids that inhibitors, if you get them into the brain, they might be an actual viable path. When you say noisy, what, you, what was the issue? I mean, yeah, the data was just too noisy. We didn't want to make any call. I mean, there could be something there, but we probably need to generate harder data before we make a commitment. Yeah, yeah, it kind of just, the data was just very noisy, and so we're kind of, it's one of these things, when you're on these big gridded experiments, that does happen sometimes. Mm -hmm. So we'll repeat that. Uh, and this is what that Jerome did. Um, I know Jerome has been really, really busy these past couple of days, so I'm actually just stealing some of his thunder and doing <laughs> a very, <laughs> <laughs> I'm everyone. just doing a very snapshot summary. But what's interesting, I just pulled out some of the data, which had actually helped me analyze some of the data. So just to show you, um, in, you know, this is just some of the single agent data you see, and I pulled out the DIPG36 line. The nice thing, DIPG36 is also another line that engraves like 007. So that's why um, you could see earlier on we tried DIPG21, which is very alto dependent, but you can engraft it. So Jerome thought it might make more sense to actually do a cell line that we can engraft if you're going to do any studies going forward. So we did DIPG36 and 007 instead. And so you could see, so 209 is active in the line, and so is the APDAC inhibitor that I told you from the company, highly brain penetrant, but has never been explored in DIPG. The and then when we do the combination, we saw some hint of additivity. But I just wanted to give you a snapshot of what an ED inhibitor had looked like. So there is a um, single agent 2009. The ED, all of the ED inhibitors practically look like that by themselves, they do nothing. And you don't see any benefit when you combine them. So I just want to show you. I mean, we're having a lot of hope going forward with some of the ED inhibitors because we thought they'll be more likely brain penetrant than the easy H2 inhibitors. But we're not seeing the kind of benefit that we hope. Uh, I'm confused. So on the left is 009. Yeah. How about the left? Yeah, this is just a single agent. I, didn't, I, just, I understand, but there's 1.9 and 3.4. Yeah. Those. Oh, yes, yeah, 009 is on, yes, that's 009, you see the number is up in the corner, so 009 is on the left, okay, and um, the one on top, that's the... Yeah, that's the uh, HDAC. HDAC, and the other one is, I just use the Abbott E. Okay, it's just a repeat, is that it? Pam? It's just a repeat? Yes, it's just a, on that okay. plate. In the plate when we did this combination, that was the IC50 for 009 on those plates. Okay. And then, because, you know, we did this full grid. Okay. of the two compounds on each plate. And I'm just showing you the single agent data on the grip. That's the two different uh, Yes, that's right. I mean, that's, that's, that's a minor. That's fine. Yeah, it's not yeah. Like, I just wanted to understand. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right, so what, I, what I've done, so combining some of the data set that we have so far, I've made an attempt at a little bit of a conclusion here is that it looks like there is a hint of um, some either synergism or additivity. Not used by any means, but look like it might be there for the HDAX, the BMI, and that PIZ kinase inhibitor. And so we only did it with 2009. Now, 2163 looks like it's a lot more potent in the DIPG line. So maybe one of the one things we might want to do now is just focus on the smaller set of combinations and then just do them with our CNS penetrant alk inhibitors to see what hint of synergy and see if 2160 is actually looking, going to look much better than 209 in the combination. And unfortunately, one of the things that we're hoping for is that the E and the easy H to angle would have actually showed promise, but we saw no efficacy in any of the lines. All right, so to sum up, um, I saw that at this stage, I mean, we've done some interesting things. We have identified potent compounds, CNS penetrant, oral bioavailable alto inhibitors with good potency, with good oral bioavailability, and we're right now looking at some proof of concept studies. We've identified ways of mitigating herd. We are doing some of the scale ups of all the lead compounds so we have enough to actually do efficacy on some tox analysis. Um, currently, for 209, Angel is currently doing an in vivo study, and then Chris Jones and Diana is also planning to do another one in another model. We're also looking at this PDM, hepside and PDM model. You know, Charles Uber is going to take a stab at that soon, so uh, just so that we can identify a PD system going forward. And more important, like as I say, our lead compounds, they have this herd liability, but 
it might be always worth taking and the way we're going to de risk it is just doing further talks like the dog telemetry. So we lead compounds right now. And I think there are some early signs of potential synergismal additivity with other mechanisms with alcohol right now. So, I mean, those are some next steps and some snapshots of where we are now. So if no one has any other questions, um, I'm going to move on to Diana's presentation. Hello. I'm going to try and share the slides from here. Okay, so how do I do this now? So Stop share. Yeah. Stop share? Mm -hmm. And then... Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Can you see it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, hi everyone. So, I'm Diana and I work in Chris's Jones Lab in London. And I'm going to mm -hmm. tell you a little bit about um, the work that I've been doing testing some of the compounds uh, from m 4 Pharma that I've helped to. So, uh, just a little bit of background uh, in terms of uh, the DIPG models that we have in the lab and how these are established. So, uh, all of them are established in the lab, or uh, we do this in collaboration with different centers across the world. Angel, that is going to speak after me, uh, also Michelle Monji in the US, but also other places. Uh, and these samples originate either from a biopsy or from autopsy. Um, in the lab, most of our samples uh, are coming from biopsies. As you can see here on the left-hand side, the cores uh, from a biopsy sample, they're very tiny. And what we uh, attempt to do is to them in vitro and in vivo. The sample comes to us from different places across the UK, either in media, uh, transport media or it's cryo to preserve it to the hospital and then sent to us. Once it arrives, uh, we put it in vitro. Uh, part of it, uh, and we do this in 2D and 3D, and we use stem cell conditions. Um, once the model has been established, we do a lot of genomic characterization. This is whole exome sequencing, methylation, and RNA seq, both on the model that we are using to test the compounds, but also to in the tumor that they originated from, so that we are sure that the genetics are comparable and are the same. Um, the sample that we receive, we also try to inject this in vivo straight from the patient sample to generate the excess, and we do serial xenografting. But also, in case the sample is sometimes being so small, what we do is we expand uh, the cells and then do uh, inject the cells and do a CD excess cell derived xenograft. And uh, we test the compounds first in vitro, of course, and once we have a hit, we go in vivo. So, this is what I've been trying to do with your compound. So these are just some of the patient-derived models that we currently have in the lab. I've selected uh, cells that carry uh, both the different types of histone mutations in the 3.1 and 3.3. Um, and we also have a wild-type DIPG that carries an ACD1 mutation and a more rare variant of the 3.1 uh, K27M, a histone H3C. For the ACO1 mutations, we have mutations in the R206H, G328, and R258G. Uh, there are other mutations that always uh, uh, segregate with both the histone and the ACO1, some P53, P38, so there is a variety of mutations and we try to choose uh, cells that have the our wild type and mutant for those. And these are the cells that I use to test your compounds. So this is how they look under the microscope. This is using laminin, the substrate, and as you can see, the morphology is quite different from cell line to cell line. Uh, some are very tiny, some are very spindly, and they also grow differently. I uh, prefer to do the screening 2D in this case because all the lines grow in 2D uh, at a good proliferation rate, and not all of them grow in 3D, so I would have more lines to compare. So I've done the screen in 2D. Um, and in terms of the models in vivo, what we see when we inject is actually that these uh, models represent uh, what we see in the patient. The, the cells are very, this is a sagittal cut of a mouse brain, and the pons are just below there, here on the right hand side in the cerebellum. 
where we inject. And what you see is an anti-human nuclei staining, so staining only human cells, and they infiltrate and invade through the normal mouse uh, brain, uh, like integrating into the with the normal cells. Uh, we don't see a big mass, a big ball of cells growing, growing and uh, pushing the normal tissue away. We see it a very, very infiltrative uh, tumor. And this is HSJD DIPG7, which is a model uh, that uh, Angel uses. But we also have this uh, for different models in the lab, either directly from uh, the patient sample or from other cells. So the essay that I've done uh, is very simple. So what I do is on day zero, I seed my cells. Uh, I wait them to grow for a bit, to recover from the splitting, and that they are in, like, in a more proliferative state. And on day three, I add my drug. And then they stay with the drug for eight days when I read the cell viability using cell type techno, which reads ATP. I use a dose range from zero to 20 micromolar. I have uh, at least three technical repeats per experiment and three to six biological repeats uh, for each line. So uh, two of the compounds that uh, we published on uh, early this year uh, were the LDN193189 and the LDN214117. So at the same time I tested M4K2009 and M4K2163, I also tested these compounds because on the paper we only had Four, uh, five out of the lines uh, that we uh, that I'm currently using now in my panel. So I wanted I, I know those compounds very well. So I wanted to have that as more of like a positive control. So I knew how the cells would behave. And what you see here, as it's shown also in the paper uh, for LDN 193 189, we see there is not really a differential between mutant and wild type. Um, and the ICFTs are in the round of uh, one micromolar. Uh, as with the LDN214117, which is a more uh, selective compound, uh, you start to see some differential, which is exactly the same what, what we've seen in, in, the, in the paper too. Uh, but what you have is a loss of potency. So nothing uh, that we hadn't seen before, but it was good to have this as a control. When you compare the IC50s between mutant and wild type, what you see for, as expected for the LDN193189, is that there isn't much of a difference between wild type and mutant, but you start to see a differential between the wild type and mutant for the more selective compound, 214117. Uh, the most uh, uh, sensitive line of the wild types is uh, SUDIPG33. So then I tested your compounds, uh, M4K2009 and another compound that at the time uh, it was uh, that you guys were interested in because it was very potent, M4K2163. And again, you have a var variety of responses, but what you see is that there is a tendency for uh, the mutant lines to be more, so more sensitive to the 2009. Uh, with the 2163, not so much, uh, but you do have more potency, it's more potent, this drug. Again, when you compare the IC50s, we still see a trend from the wild type to the mutant. And again, the outlier here is SUDIPG33, like in the 214117, and here is Biomedi181, which is an ACBI1 mutant, and again, is one of also the most resistance with the compound 214117. With 2163, uh, we have a, the, the more of a spread for the wild type lines uh, when compared to the mutants. So it's hard to say that they are highly uh, that there is a tendency here, and there is this outlier here, which once again is Biomedi181, uh, which is also the most resistant on 2009 and 214117. Hi, so, Diana. Diana, this is Angel. Can you, tell me, can you tell me, please, what is the IC50 for DIPG7 from Barcelona for the M4K 2009? So DIPG7 is 1.1 1 .1 okay. and 2163 is 0 0.1. Okay, thank you, Diana. That's in 2D. Uh, I've also done in 3D, uh, but I don't have like the numbers here, but it's, it's also a similar range. Okay, thanks. Um, so I think overall this is quite encouraging. 
well, we do have some outliers in terms of the, um, the wild types and the mutants, uh, but having uh, the data that for the, the molecular characterization of these models is something we can explore in terms of both the genetics to see if there are any other mutations in the pathway, also if the expression of these cells uh, might overexpress some of the off-target um, uh, of, of target, uh, of targets of the, um, the drugs or any, you know, BMP signaling related um, molecules. So overall, uh, M4K2009, which is a derivative of 21417, is more potent than this compound. And it does show some selectivity for the ACR1 mutant cells. 2163 is uh, definitely more potent than 2009, but I think we lose a bit of the selectivity here. And uh, what I'm doing next uh, with this compound, so I've been doing a tolerability on NSG animals for the last uh, two weeks and they do seem to tolerate the 100 mix per kilo per day. So I'm finishing that uh, tomorrow. And then I'm gonna move on to do the efficacy study using uh, an allograph model uh, from Oren Becker, the RCAS uh, 3.1 K27M, ACBR1 R206 that contains also PDGFA and a P53 loss. And that's it. Diana, could you say again, <coughs> how, how long was the tolerability for the M4K 2009? So tomorrow is going to be day 10. Okay. Yeah. And they haven't lost any weight. Uh, I, do, I did see some uh, initial signs of toxicity um, in, in the animals, um, but then they recovered uh, and they seem okay for now. Sorry, I can just uh, if you can elaborate on that. When did you start seeing some kind of tox effect and how long did it take for it to recover? So in the, first, to in the first two, two to three days, and then after that, they, they, we, they didn't lose any weight. If your measurement of toxicity is the weight, they didn't lose any weight, so they didn't stop eating. But uh, what I saw is some uh, pallor erection, some, uh, the, when the whiskers go to the front, um, so they just didn't look quite right, but then slowly they recovered. So I think it was the first two doses, two to three doses, and then they were okay. Thank you very much. Just, uh, I have another question. This is in adult mice? Sorry? Is, is this in adult or kind of juvenile yeah. animals? Yeah. This was in uh, mice with uh, six weeks because it's probably when I'm going to treat them. So I did try to do the same age. Okay, thank you. Um, Diana, could you comment on so all of those cell lines that you just showed us? I mean, can, can they all be engrafted in mouse, or you actually find some of them engrafted and some don't? I mean, what's your, if you go back to that table? Go back to the list. Your table of all of the mutations in the different cell lines that you have. Yeah. So out of, so these, all, lines, out of these lines yeah. that I've done myself and also some other people have done, so the IPG7 for sure, Angel uh, knows that. By ICR, by B181, yes, we can inject. Um, the PDX takes about six to seven months. So uh, the, um, you know, when we inject it directly from the tissue, uh, the cells take longer. So I'm currently now on eight to nine months for that. Uh, and I'm collecting the brains to be able to serial xenograph uh, to see if I'm able to make it a quicker model without losing, uh, of course, uh, the genetics. Uh, I believe, Angel, can, you can correct me here, that he, the HSJ, the IPG18 has been injected, uh, but the take rate wasn't great, like one out of two animals. Um, yes, the, we didn't see any engraftment or very, very few animals. It wasn't robust enough to, to follow this model. Yes, uh, so SUDIPG21 and SUDIPG36, I haven't done it myself. I've contacted uh, Michelle, the lab of Michelle Monji, and what they told me is the IPG36 uh, doesn't, well, doesn't really, is a model that you can use in their hands, that they've injected them, but it didn't really grow very well. And the same goes for SUDIPG21. OPBG, the IPG4 is quite a, um, uh, it's a line that I've received recently, so I haven't, I don't yet have results for that. Uh, I haven't injected CHA28. SUDIPG6 does grow in vivo and it grows very nicely. QCTBR059 does grow, but it does take a long time. 
D003 doesn't grow. I've injected and I didn't have tumors after one year. ACDIPG33, uh, again, not in my hands, in Michelle Monge's lab, uh, it didn't take. And ICR by, uh, by B184 uh, does grow in vivo. And it, I think the, the survival is for the PDX, so directly from the patient, is around, um, oh, I don't want to lie, but I think maybe five to six months. Just, uh, I just wanted to uh, add a bit of information to that. So I, I also tried the IPG36 here in Toronto, and uh, they do engraft in the brain, but uh, it doesn't give uh, reliably really nice diffuse tumors like the, the, uh, the IPG7 do. So I think that the IPG7 is a better kind of like nice and filtrative mm -hmm. the IPG model. Mm -hmm. So they do engraft in the brain, like you see tumors and everything, but they, they're not uh, as nicely diffused and filtrative as the 007. So maybe not that good as a model. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, that was really insightful. Thanks a lot. Looking forward to some of the vivo studies after that. Any other questions from Diana? If not, move over to Angel. So Angel, I'm going to project your slides, and then you could just tell me when to advance. Do you want to do it like that? Please let me do it here. From here. Oh. Okay. So do I have to do anything to give him control, or he should have it? Uh, I need to do. To sorry. Share my screen, and I will share uh, this PowerPoint. Okay. Do you see it? Yeah. Perfect. Okay. So uh, today. Um, I'm going to present what we've done so far with the number seven DIPG model from Barcelona. You know this model has a 100% take rate. Median survival is between 70 and 100 days usually. We've done may, maybe like, um, please could you, could, you, could you close your, your microphone? Uh, oh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, the media survival is usually 70 to 100 days and we've repeated this probably in 10 preclinical trials, and it is very diffuse, as you say. So my, my student later did this during the summer. Um, okay, one second. Huh? Here. Do you still see it? Yes, okay. So I, I will, first I will put a couple of examples to show this model is, uh, robust enough to do these trials. This is from the Diana's paper, but this ha has a little more uh, detail. So you can see here, this treatment with the LDN193189 provided a benefit over in survival of the animals for a couple of weeks. And the treatments were given for like four weeks, okay? And here is the objective way to analyze whether the animals had the benefit in survival or not. We don't see, we don't look at the animals and decide whether they are sick or not. We just collect the weight every day or as, as many times as, as we can. And when they lose 20% of their maximum weight, we decide that we, we take that at, as the endpoint. So following this objective method, we can validate uh, better our results, I think. And this is true for this assay, but it is also true for other assays like such as this one uh, with another drug targeting the PA3K AKT pathway that uh, didn't provide the benefits. So you can see here the three groups control and two doses, they overlapped perfectly in the trial. Um, and uh, you, can, you can see the animals just uh, uh, finish their lives at, at the same time. So uh, I wanted when, when we started to work with this uh, M4K 2009, we wanted to see the results here in vitro first. And we, this is a six day uh, incubation with the drug and we got 0 0.8 micromolar, which is very close to the 1.1 micromolar Diana told us uh, a few minutes ago. So this is good enough for me, especially because the, the CNS penetrance of this compound is very good, like five micromolar. So I was more than happy to do the in vivo. 
Um, to design the NVivo study, uh, we used uh, not skipped mice from NVivo. We buy the mice when they are three weeks old, then we let them for one or two weeks here. We do the surgery. We inoculated the tumor on July 18 uh, in 48 animals. Uh, we started treatment 32 days later. Uh, we made four groups. One was the control. The group number two, we wanted to give four weeks at uh, 100 milligram per kilo. Uh, group three, uh, half of the dose, also for four weeks. And group four, the maximum dose for eight weeks, if possible. So the strategy is a double, uh, we have two goals. One goal is to evaluate the PK or PD after just right after they finish the treatment. So we sacrifice three mice from groups one to three at the end of treatment. That means at, after four weeks of treatment here. Um, and then, then we let the, the remaining mice survive to complete the survival study with this endpoint criteria, 20% weight loss. Uh, so we left them untreated until, until endpoint, which is 20% weight loss. So, so far, we observed during this first week or first 10 days, given the drug, this kind of not perfect results with the mice. We got four casualties uh, in groups two and three. Um, I think mm, after hearing to Diana, and, um, I interpret that this might be related to the to the vehicle or the oral dosing of these mice. This could be also related to the technician doing the, doing the dosing maybe. So in this case, it could be attributed to that, I think more than to the, to the drug. Uh, anyway, after two weeks of treatment and due to these observations, we, we observed like a 6% weight loss in groups two to four. So we decided to stop treatments for one week and see whether they recovered a little bit the hair and the, and the weight. So uh, we started the treatments again uh, last Monday and they are, uh, we will give them two more weeks, Monday to Friday. So uh, we are monitoring the weight of the treated animals, as you can see here. So we started treatments at day 32 you see this decrease in the mean, median weight, mean weight. Uh, and like, as Diana said, then they tend to recover or to maintain. Uh, anyway, we decided to stop one week. They recovered a little bit and now they are here, right at day 56 today, I guess. We made a mistake here and we didn't uh, start treatments with vehicle in the control group exactly the same day. This is because usually when we give a drug uh, and the vehicle is okay or saline or PBS, we just don't, don't give the vehicle. But here we should have given the, the vehicle to the animals because then I have uh, the, this uh, question, is this due to the drug or due to the vehicle? So uh, when I came back from the summer break, I decided to start, I, I, I said to my students to start treatments in the control mice. So these are the control mice. They didn't get the vehicle until, until day 46. Then they started to have the vehicle and you can see the same effect as the drug. So I think this is uh, the effect of the vehicle more than the drug, okay? So I'm not very concerned about the, the drug being toxic, but the vehicle, I think we should, work a little bit to change it for another one. Uh, that could be, uh, if that's doable, I don't know if you are trying to do it or you tried in the past, but I, I suggest to do that. So this is what I have so far. So, uh, yeah, please. Yeah, yeah, I mean, those are things we actually, I mean, we have the standard vehicle we do for early screening. And you know, we, we, we have used it in others in a graph study and stuff and it was tolerated, but like, as I say, every model is different. Mm -hmm. And so, but I mean, the compounds have good solubility properties. So I think switching to like methyl cellulose and stuff <coughs> should actually be okay. But it's good that you pointed that out. I think for these JIPG studies, maybe we might need to switch to methyl cellulose and do some. Yeah, I, 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 
I think so. I think it's interesting to change to switch to CMC because yeah. in the past I used CMC and the appearance mm -hmm. and the and the thickness of the solution is exactly the same as for the this PEC 300. So mm -hmm. if, if you are looking for the for the thickness, it's the same. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So, yeah, uh, we, we we can expect uh, sorry we can expect to finish this study in uh, three or more or four more weeks, and hope hopefully we'll see a survival benefit here. I don't know. Hopefully. Okay. Yeah. Look forward <laughs> to that. Your fingers crossed. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you for that update. Yeah. Okay. Good. Any other questions for Angle? If not, we move on. Okay, to say the schedule, so it's to Jean Fou. Uh, so we take back uh, Sophia again. Here? Yes. yes. Get back on to, mm -hmm. and then uh, it's Jean Fou. <sighs> okay, so Jean Fou and Alex, you know? Thanks, that's uh, been that's really helpful. Can you, thanks. Um, yeah. Great data from the others. Um, just a comment, the mouse studies in FOP and other diseases for LGN 193, 189, I think they're often effective even at sort of five mg per kg per day. Um, so it'd be great if the M4K compound, at least in future studies, shows data at much lower doses. Um, but hopefully your 100 mg is not toxic anyway. Okay, can you go to the next slide, Mastin? So we've got a couple of us presenting today. Um, we've got some data from ourselves, but also some comments from FOP literature, which we can share. Um, so um, we've got some comments on questions that we've been asked in the past, um, and then some other data on some of your protax and things. So I'll hand over first to Alison. Next slide. Um, so maybe I, do you want to comment on this? Okay. So um, people have known or asked us in the past, both from the FOP field and from the, the DIPG field, um, whether all of the compounds we're making will actually affect all the FOP or DIPG mutations equipotently. Um, so uh, one of the mutations actually occurs in the ATP binding pocket, which is obviously our drug target site. Um, it's this DFG motif, which is the spartate in that motif, binds the magnesium associated with the ATP. But the glycine, which is actually mutated here, is a bit more distant from the drug binding site. And classically, in all our studies to date, we find that all the mutants uh, bind the compounds equipotently. And Alison has been exploring that more thoroughly in our nanobrat cell engagement assay. So, next slide. Okay, hi, this is Alison. So, as Alex was saying, we've taken um, the M4K compounds of interest 2009, 2163, 2117, and 2234, uh, sorry, 2236, and also the 3078, which is one of the blueprint series of compounds. So, we um, talked about this data last week. So, we showed, I've just come into the team, so we did some assays just to make sure that John Foo's historical data and my new data was matching, so that's over on the left-hand side, and you can see the IC50s produced are really similar between the ALK2 wild-type nanobret assays. Moving that forward, we took the 206H, 3258B, Q207D, and 356D mutant lines in the ALK2 nanobret, showing that the M4K series um, compounds of interest showed no change in IC50 between the different mutants compared to the wild-type. Of interest is the 3078, which shows a significant shift in um, sensitivity. So in the 356D, there's almost no sensitivity in uh, the ALK2 nanobrit assay compared to the other mutants. I've done this in two independent replicates, and it is showing that this replicates. So um, yeah, I think that's quite interesting that this 356 is showing no activity. So we do have the crystal structure of one of these blueprint compounds, 3007, um, without two. But we can look at the structure and see if that's anywhere close to the G356D mutation site. We haven't looked at that yet. 
that's amazing. Just for people who are less familiar with the assay, this is in hex cells, and it's just looking at target binding. It's not looking at signaling or viability. It's purely target engagement. Um, but we thought that was quite um, interesting, but it's very fortunate that all the M4K2000 series um, our clinical lead compounds are effective against all the mutants tested so far. Next slide. Zhang Fu. So here I've taken um, some new compounds and basically checked them uh, in terms of um, viability um, GI50 in one of the DIPG cell lines, which is um, um, SUDIPG21. And um, in this, the activity of out uh, 2 in terms of the direct binding measured by target engagement is very well mirrored uh, in terms of like the reduction in the viability, as can be seen in the from the left and the right panels. And in this, I've preceded the cells um, um, overnight and treated the cells with a different co compound dilution for seven days and measured the uh, viability using. Um, South Tyler Glow. Yeah, and. Next slide. Yeah. And so this is a comparison with some historical data. And I found that uh, among them, the um, SUDIPG21 is the one that um, mirrors the out to binding um, activity the most in terms of the responsiveness. Whereas I see moderate response in uh, SUDIPG uh, um, 007, as well as uh, even weaker response in SUDIPG number four. And for most of the um, M4K compound, they, they, they are not effective on um, either DIPGs with wild type up to, or on, um, on the far right hand side, an unrelated um, glioblastoma cell line. Next slide. So um, there was an interesting publication just a couple of weeks ago in Embo Molecular Medicine, also from Spain, interestingly enough, in the FOP field. And um, they have a mouse model for FOP with a constitutive active out 2 receptor, which is a Q27D mutant. And this forms extraskeletal bone formation, for example, in the hind limb in the animal model on the left panel. And then they're dosing similar to the studies that Angel and Diana have presented with out 2 inhibitors, uh, typically to block that ossification. What's interesting in this study is that they blocked it with a PI3 kinase alpha inhibitor. They used the Novartis drug. Um, and what's interesting is the mechanism. So. The PI3K alpha activates AQT, which activates GSK3, which then can phosphorylate and stabilize SMAD transcription factors, which are the effectors of our L2 BMP receptor. So if you have a PI3K alpha inhibitor, you can actually reduce the levels of the SMAD effectors downstream of our signaling receptor. And you can see that particularly in the top uh, Western block panel with the levels of the phosphosmad 1,5, um, albeit they're treating with quite high levels of compounds here, I think. But um, the mechanism they claim is that the benefit in the FOP mouse model in part is through um, actually the out 2 pathway itself. Um, next slide. And of course, it's some of you um, might know the PI3K inhibitors are already in the clinic, um, particularly in phase one in DIPG and phase two in adults. Um, so it would be interested to see if PI3K inhibitors do have some activity in terms of influencing the out 2 pathway itself, um, as well as through the canonical mTOR um, signaling pathway. Next slide. Um, yeah, um, so I've done a small scale of synergy um, antagonism uh, uh, study, um, and these are with um, SU uh, DIPG number four as well as uh, HSJD DIPG number uh, 007. 
and um, and in this I'm using um, either in <coughs> BYL719, which is a PI3K uh, alpha inhibitor um, on itself, or in combination with um, uh, basically a matrix of um, M4K 2009 or 3078, which is the blueprint uh, compound. And I saw that the um, PI3K inhibitor by itself is about uh, is having about 1.3 micromolar um, GI50 con um, value. And um, unfortunately, I did not see a strong synergistic effect between them. And with all my studies, I'm using um, the COM benefit um, program from Cambridge, from um, yeah, and with with that analysis, basically, it's comparing whether um, the effect seen in a particular combination point um, is additive or whether um, it is synergistic or and uh, and antagonistic. And yeah, I found that. Unfortunately, the PI3K kinase, uh, the PI3K inhibitor did not really synergize with the both of the M4K compound. And to the next slide. And I've also um, <coughs> evaluated the hashtag inhibitors from uh, that Mathlin sent me uh, um, a few weeks ago. And so uh, on the top panel is uh, OICR22. Uh, 20226 and the bottom is uh, OICR 11221. So they are both uh, HSTAC inhibitors. And I saw a weak um, synergistic effect uh, um, between them. And um, I've tested them both in um, on the right hand, uh, on the left hand side, um, DIPG number seven, and on the right hand side, uh, DIPG uh, number four. And uh, with either M4K 2009, um, 2163, and as well as 3078. And I see that either there's no uh, diminishing return or a, a weak uh, synergistic, uh, synergistic uh, effect with them. And um, on itself, I found that the um, GI50 or EC50 values um, of the HSTAC inhibitor to be. Um, of particularly 11221 um, to be moderately potent, around 200 to 600 uh, nanomolar, whereas the 20226 uh, to be uh, uh, higher. It's about like 1.8 uh, micromolar. And yeah, so this might. Be did you test? Did you test 20226 and by itself on the other line? Uh, yeah. So uh, the two zero two six, I, I tested it uh, only on um, number seven because um, I accidentally lost the plate. Okay. Yeah, for for okay. the other cell line. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Next slide. And um, so this is a summary of um, a few of the products that have been synthesized by uh, both Charles Lab and as well as OICR, and shown in, in red and green are the uh, corresponding uh, binding uh, IC50 towards up to in a, in a cellular assay. And and they are basically uh, synthesized based on FOK uh, 2009. And um, three of the compounds has a drastic drop in, in terms of the um, IC50 values. But we are thinking that it's likely not because of um, the actual uh, reduction in actual binding potency, but rather could be uh, reduced permeability to the cells. And uh, encouragingly, uh, M4K3102 um, is having at least similar potency or even uh, higher potency, uh, binding potency to uh, ARC2. And next slide. Yeah, and Unfortunately, uh, in our hand, we, we haven't managed to identify uh, a good antibody for uh, out 2 which would have enabled us to uh, nicely study the uh, reduction in the endogenous level of out 2 And it, 
even the antibodies that initially I thought uh, were promising. And so shown here is that um, I've transfected um, a fusion version of ALK2, which should have around uh, 20 kilodalton shift. And then uh, as compared to the empty vector, and I, I do not see any specific um, signal on the uh, cell line with uh, transfection um, at the correct size. So, yeah, so a, a working antibody is still uh, to be identified. So, we can move on to the next slide. And here I'm showing um, some more recent results where uh, on the left hand side um, I've transfected the cell, uh, cells with ALK2 wild type with a flag tag. And on the right hand side I'm, I've transfected a muted ether version of uh, ALK2 which is drug resistant and also a flag tag. And I've, um, after 24 hours of transfection, I treated the cells with um, different ALK2 protects for 12 hours and look uh, and check at um, the flag uh, tag level. And unfortunately, the initial uh, result that I thought was uh, that looks slightly promising uh, turned out to be uh, just a non-specific effect on um, on the cells as the um, ALK2 T283I mutant that is resistant to the drug um, should have been, um, the level should have been the same, well, but it basically mirrors the wild type ALK2. So in this case, uh, pointing to that, uh, the compound is just having a non-specific effect on the slightly the protein synthesis. Yeah, so I'm still in the process on like getting identifier identifying a working antibody for ALK2. And to the next slide. And this is a summary that um, Alison did recently. Uh, so this is the summary of the most recent ALK2 nanobret IC50 studies. So not a huge amount of interest except a couple of compounds which have come out, which is the M4K 2267, which is a borderline activity at 120 nanomolars, and one of the Protax M4K3102 is showing really encouraging activity at 20 nanomolars. So I'll repeat this study just to confirm the assay, and if that does replicate, then we'll take that forward for additional studies. Is there much quality control on, I mean, if you look at mass spec and things for 3102, could it be contaminated with any cleaved uh, molecule, or is it Definitely intact. TV, TV. Just wondering if Sue is on the line. Oh. Sorry. Oh. Sorry, I didn't realise that question was for me. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, can you, could, what was the question again? Sorry. You want to know the, sorry, go ahead. The potency of that molecule is very different to the other protacts. Yeah. So either we're just lucky with the linker, et cetera, that's soluble and getting through the cell membrane, or I just wondered, could it be contamination of some free uh, drug from the protact linker, if there could be any contamination in the sample? So I wonder what the validation told you. The, the um, the, I mean, the purest... The 3102. The, these compounds are quite difficult to purify, as you can imagine. Um, so I think we've set 90% as our purity criteria rather than our normal higher purity levels on these um, just because they are really hard to get clean. Um, but I would be surprised if there was any really large amounts. I mean, the, the, there were minor impurities. I can have a look um, uh, when we're offline to see whether see what the purity of that one and, and get okay. back to you on that, but um, I don't envisage it should be that poorly pure. Pure. Yeah, we, made, we made two of them, and we had no problems actually with them. They were very clean in LCMS. Mm -hmm. yeah. But all that from the papyrusine, so I don't know if that makes a difference yeah. in terms of yeah. property. <laughs> Okay. Thank I don't you. imagine That's it would lot. be. I don't imagine it would be a degradation product. Quite. I. I don't think so. No. But. No. Um, but you. You okay. can't really necessarily t say for sure. Mm -hmm. I think that's our last slide. 
Okay, nice. Quite an update. Yeah, that's going on. So I guess we gotta really find a better antibody to really check down how these projects are working. And it may not be an easy feat, but hopefully we'll get there. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from Alex and his team? If not, yeah, we're looking on schedule. So, time for some chemistry. Um, so, we're going to start off with Sue. Yep. Uh, this. Okay. There we go. Okay. So, can you move forward then, please? Yeah. Okay. So, just a general update on progress. Um, so, with holidays and everything during August, we were only able to complete the synthesis of one compound, and that's gone in for screening. There's a further three uh, this month, which are one sort of blueprint type compound and two more, two more Protax. Um, so, obviously, uh, we've had a discussion last week with uh, Alex and his team, um, and we think that we can apply a, a small amount of additional biology resource to help out with this. And I've got a slide at the end. Unfortunately, uh, Vad wasn't able to join the meeting because he's in a, he's in another meeting. So I, I'll try and talk through it, but it's very biology, so. <laughs> Um, so we've now signed the SOW for the rat hepcidin model, um, so that should be going ahead shortly. Um, and uh, you'll be pleased to know that Julia has actually managed to start a little bit of work on the patient cell line. Um, there's nothing yet to report, but um, hopefully in the next... ...meeting... She'll be able to present. That's been one of our client, uh, who's one of the cooking, um, presented a poster and a flash poster, you know, single slide presentation at the uh, Cambridge MedChem conference earlier this week. Um, so you can see a picture on the left hand side of the poster. And I'm very pleased to say that he actually won a prize for his poster. So we were really, really pleased with that. Uh, that's next, that's that, that, <laughs> so that's really good. So we're, we're getting the word out there <laughs> as, okay. much as, we, as much as we possibly can. That's good. Yeah. Okay, so next slide, please. So, yeah, I mean, this is my sort of routine slide on the blueprint project so obviously 3007 has good potency good selectivity uh, but it had very poor brain penetration in the PK study so our aims really have been to try and improve the overall physchem properties um, while maintaining the select the potency and selectivity so we check the MPO scores for the majority of our uh, new compounds and generally they're greater than 4.5 so that's that looks at a combination of of the physchem properties molecular weight log p pka etc so next slide please so as i mentioned we've only had results on one new compound and um so sorry so we've only submitted one new compound. We haven't got the data. So the compound is the compound on the right-hand side, 3104. Um, so it's like, again, a slightly different core. Uh, so it would be interesting to see the results on that. I think we should get that coming through any time now, I would think. Um, but the, the fluoro compound 3093, which we reported back last week, um, is, is an interesting compound. Unfortunately, we didn't have enough material. Uh, available um, at the time for it to go straight into a PK study but it does have a lower PKA uh, so we might an anticipate that uh, hopefully with a bit of luck it might have a better uh, profile in PK so the recent is in progress the critical step in that is the introduction of that fluorine and on the during the initial um, synthesis we got an extremely low yield on that fluorination just sufficient which is the reason we didn't have very much material so it was just sufficient to be able to submit the compound so we started a resynthesis of that uh hot off the press today is uh one of the chemists managed to find and improved uh conditions for the fluorination so hopefully um 
we'll, we'll be able to bring that material through fairly soon. So next slide, please. Uh, so this really is just a, a repeat of something I've presented last time. We've got some, because we're, we're moving out of the holiday season now, uh, we've got a bit more resource available uh, that we can start to apply to the synthesis of some of the targets on, on this slide. Um, so in the, uh, at the bottom, I've just included uh, some additional targets where uh, this, um, what do you call it, azobenzimidazole compound 3095 was reasonably potent. Um, and we're, we were just sort of wondering whether we can cut back, um, because this is now, again, a bidentate hinge interaction, which we see in the other blueprint patent. Um, so can we actually make compound, much smaller compounds sort of reducing the molecular weight in this series. It removes, removes one of the basic centers, it removes an H bond donor, and it also lowers the molecular weight. Um, so uh, hopefully we might be able to make a few of those compounds as well. So the next slide. Um, so this was, uh, this is the second blueprint pattern that I was talking about. So in these, these are um, azo indoles rather than on the previous slide, they were azo in Aza Um So we've been trying to make some of the compounds uh, from this series. Uh, interestingly, we see that they are fairly under, unstable under uh, basic, purific con basic purification conditions. Um, and the compound, we, we initially were, we were at the final step of compound 30, and unfortunately during purification it decomp decomposed. We've now found some improved purification conditions. So compound seven has been completed um, and will be sent for screening next week and compound 30 is currently in purification. Um, we, we're, we're still progressing with the synthesis of compound 68 but it's proving a little bit more challenging but uh, I'm sure we'll be able to get there soon. Uh, so next slide please. Uh, so this is really a summary of the protax. So uh, we've made another two protax. Um, which are shown here. So again, these both have this, the same linker in 30, as the same attachment to uh, the main core as we see in 3102, which is the compound that we've just heard um, is shows 20 nanomolar in the nanobrect, and it was 11 nanomolar in the um, enzyme assay. And so these are the two uh, additional compounds we've made. Based on what we saw with 3102, we might anticipate 3106 might be better than 3107, but we will uh, we'll submit those uh, next week. We've also got um, some people working on this. Um, the plans are to make a range of different uh, linkers, uh, peg lengths, and the different um, ligate, Eli, uh, Eli, E3 li ligand on the end. So the aim is to try and reduce the, the number of H bond donors, lower the TPSA, and try and enhance the cell permeability, and obviously also brain penetration. But you know there are um, always slight concerns on brain penetration, but uh, we do know that it is from the literature that it is possible to get brain penetrant protax. So the next slide, please. So this is the biology slide. So as I say, we're, we're going to try and help out a little bit with um, the identification of, of an antibody. So you heard that, um, that at the SGC they're actually struggling a little bit to find an antibody. So we've got quite a lot of experience in our biology department looking at um, protax in particular. Um, we've had some validation of H, HDAC4 protax. Um, and uh, shown at the top was uh, the um, some figures from the uh, from that program. Um, so we're going to look at a range of different uh, a number of different commercial antibodies in some various cell lines, um, and hopefully we'll be able to provide some support to the work going on at the SGC. Um, so we've said an estimate of two to four weeks, but that's of actual lab time, not passage of time because obviously this is not done, this is not the people, the individual's main project work, but we're hoping to be able to um, provide some sort of support over the next uh, period of time to, and to test some compounds as well if required. And I think that's my last slide. 
Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah. Is it worth testing any of the antibodies in applications other than Western, whether it's immunofluorescence or Mr. Chemistry or something like that? Yes, yeah, possible. Um, as I say, I'm not a biologist, so uh, <laughs> I can yeah. feed that back to Vad. Yeah. I mean, I'm hoping. I think, and I'm hoping. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry. I, I was just thinking that it might be quite a good idea. You know, we had a, a, a conversation last week. I think it might be a good idea if we actually have a sort of reasonably regular uh, discussion on this because, you know, we don't want to all start going down the same line, and especially if it's unsuccessful. But, um, sure, that sounds good. Yeah, okay. Perhaps we can set up something when I'm back from my holiday next week. Okay, and I'm hoping, you know, in the spirit of the open science, I mean, if yeah. anybody else on the line from other institutions have, you know, experience with alto antibodies or have some chicks of the trade of how to get good antibodies, we're quite happy to hear some of that and exchange some of that knowledge with us. So, so please feel free to contact any one of us if you have insights into getting better antibodies. Okay, thanks. So, um, so up next is um, Dave is going to give an update on some of the chemistry from our end. Uh, so, Okay, no, everything's good. Go on, come. You want yeah. me to? Pardon? You want me to drive this light? Sure. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, hello, everyone. It's been a while since I've given an update on some of the SAR efforts that have been made at the OACR. Um, so I'm just going to summarize some of the key points that I made in my last presentation. As you guys are well aware, I'm working on expanding the uh, amide series of ALK2 inhibitors. And there were two compounds that we were particularly interested in, M4K2184 and M4K2192, not only because they were potent against ALK2, but they also have a reduced affinity for the HERG ion channel. But these compounds suffer from uh, two key things. They have very poor pharmacokinetic profiles in vivo, and also they don't perform very well in KCO2 permeability assays. They have very high efflux ratios. So a couple of modifications are made to these two compounds. Uh, if you can go to the next slide. So as, as I mentioned in my previous presentation, um, we were trying to mask the terminal piperazine NH bond by installing a variety of aliphatic groups to the piperazine motif. And um, this is sort of a proof of concept. This did help to reduce the efflux ratio substantially by more than tenfold, and there was a slight improvement in permeability for the fluoromethoxy amide compound. Um, if you can go to the next slide. Unfortunately, we didn't notice the same trend for the dimethoxy amide compounds. Um, installing those aliphatic groups had very little effect on improving uh, permeability or reducing efflux. We decided to make a few more modifications to try to salvage these uh, compounds. If you can go to the next slide. So we attempted to reduce the basicity of the pyridine nitrogen by installing a nitrile group at the four position of the pyridine ring instead of the typical four methyl group. Um, unfortunately, uh, this didn't do much to reduce the efflux ratio as I will be discussing in the next slide. But as you can see, the potencies were still relatively good. Um, there wasn't much of a difference in terms of selectivity in comparison to the parent compounds 2239 and 2236. And uh, one last modification that we wanted to make was to see whether the replacement of the orthofluorine substituent with a more hydrophobic and larger sized halogen substituent could improve selectivity or potency. Um, it's been reported in the literature that having larger substituents, ortho-2 and amide, can actually modify or vary uh, the conformation of that amide with respect to the benzene plane. Uh, so as you can see, if you can click uh, methane on the next slide, there is an improvement in selectivity as we go from a methoxy to a fluorine to a chlorine substituent, which, um, which was very interesting and very exciting for us. Uh, if you can go to the next slide. 
Unfortunately, as I had mentioned, uh, the nitrile analogs really didn't uh, make much of an improvement um, in terms of reducing efflux or improving permeability. Uh, for the chlorine analogs, we noticed a similar trend um, in comparison to the fluoromethoxyamide compounds. Having that naked papyrazine uh, really is detrimental in terms of permeability, but as soon as we alkylate it, even with a simple methyl group, we're able to see an improvement in permeability and a reduction in the efflux ratio. Okay. So another thing that we had noticed um, at the beginning of our studies was there were a couple of amides um, which really didn't uh, see much of an improvement in potency or selectivity when they had that methyl group installed on there. Actually, generating the desmethyl compound um, improved the selectivity and potency for some of the analogs. So this is something that we strictly observed just in the amide series. So a couple of analogs were made uh, which did not include that 4-methyl group. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't really able to notice a trend for the desmethyl analogs. Uh, there was only really an improvement in potency and selectivity for M4K2251, but this same trend wasn't really observed for the cell-based results. Um, for the chlorine analogs, there's a bit of a reduction in selectivity, and also um, uh, for the desmethoxyamide compounds we weren't really able to see much of an improvement in cell-based selectivity either. So that's just something that maybe we can further discuss because installing that methyl group on that pyridine group can be a little bit expensive. Um, yeah, can you go to the next slide? So a couple of other analogs that were made that were not necessarily related to the amide series uh, included M4K2262, which had a 2-ethanol um, sort of group attached to that papyrazine motif. Uh, the purpose of doing that was trying uh, to reduce the basicity of that papyrazine, but unfortunately, the compound wasn't as potent as we would have liked um, in the cell-based nanobrett assay. Um, a one-carbon homologation of the methoxy group uh, ortho to the amide resulted in the generation of M4K2263, but this compound was um, not very active in either the biochemical or cell-based assay. And then two additional analogs which actually fuse two of the aromatic rings of M4K2009 together or M4K2265 and 2267. When we adopt these analogs with ALK2, um, they actually showed some promising interactions with the hinge region of ALK2 and also for M4K2267, the confirmation of it was quite similar to M4K2009 using that docking program. Uh, for 265, 2265, the potency was not very good, but for 2267, the potency was moderate. Um, and so we're looking into making maybe a couple more analogs of that isoquinoline uh, compound. And then finally, the compound on the left was um, the anticipated uh, compound from Novartis, from the Novartis patent that Sue had mentioned a couple of uh, months ago. Um, I believe they reported it to have an IC50 of 110 nanomolar against SALC2, but when we synthesized it and tested it, it was actually completely inactive, so that's uh, interesting. Mm -hmm. Go to the next slide. Mm -hmm. And finally, a couple of other analogs that we've already um, synthesized and we're just waiting for their uh, biological evaluation include some of these thiophene regioisomers. Uh, we want to see if um, sort of changing the geometry of that amide with respect to the aromatic ring will actually be um, beneficial in terms of binding to ALK2. And then M4K2272, which doesn't have any ortho substituents, um, is, was made to sort of fill a hole in the SAR. And so we're excited to see those results. Mm -hmm. That's it. Good. Nice. Very nice summary on the air by side. Any questions for Deba? Nice job. If not, I think that takes care of most of the presentation for today. And you're actually right on time. We are half an hour early. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if there are any burning questions, issues, I mean, there are some items that I think you know, that we need to sort of think about yes, of some concern is the antibody study, mm -hmm. you know, with ALK2 because I think some of that antibody could actually help us. If we get some of these POTACs, you know, sorted out, it really help us determine which of all of these DAPG lines are truly, you know, ALK2 dependent. We can use chemical means of 
determine dependency. So it's nice to see like some of the stuff that Jean Fouchard would continue to enforce that the DIPG line, you know, based on just chemical diversity and activity, that line seems to be really showing correlation with alto activity. It would be nice to form that up with some knockout studies and so chemically knocking out the target could actually help reinforce the dependence. And by learning that, we could learn about all of the DIPG lines we're looking at, which ones are really alpha dependent, which ones are not. So I think if we could develop any antibody to kind of validate degradation study for some of these products, that's going to be huge. Uh, um, are there antibodies for the other ALK members? Is it a family um, issue that tends to be a challenge, or is it specific for ALK2? That's a good question. Alex, uh, John Fu, can any one of you answer that question? Sorry, we were talking. What was the question? <laughs> Hi, Alex. The question was um, with the dip issues with uh, ALK2 antibody development. I was just curious whether it's a family um, issue in general. There are no, are there antibodies for the other members such as ALK3, ALK5, etc. That's absolutely the case. I think it's a whole family issue. Um, as I mentioned, we can reach out to a collaborator in Japan and see what can happen there. Um, Phosphismad might be another readout, but that's an indirect readout of a downstream protein rather than what we want to look at. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yep. Um, and then the other thing is hopefully we just be patient. Hopefully next three weeks we get some more update from Angel about the efficacy yeah. studies. We'll follow up on alternative vehicle. Maybe we should probably take two or nine and a couple of compounds and just look at the exposure in another vehicle mm -hmm. to support any subsequent in, in vivo studies that we choose to do and avoiding the current formulation if we have. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I think that's it. And maybe, so, so if you get a chance, it would be nice to exchange that poster from the student. Hi. You know, yeah. Okay, yeah, I can yeah. send you a copy of the poster. Yeah, yeah. yeah we'll just put it up on our website, too, if yeah. we can. Yeah, sure. That's good. Oh, David, have another question? So just one more question for Diva. I was kind of surprised that just looking at the structure that it was so dead on the ALK2. The, the, the novatic compound? compound? Yeah, yeah, it was a beautiful yeah. NMR. Yeah. And I decided. Yeah. Just curious as to what the offending part of the molecule is. Is it? And could you put that um, isopropyl pyridone on our she, sample? She, she did it. So, oh. so she actually used pieces of this and put it in our sa and mm -hmm. actually killed the activity too. Yeah. So, so that's, no, that's the I mean, I, we, we docked the compound as well and it looks like it really ought to, uh, it, you know, there's no evidence to suggest it shouldn't, uh, shouldn't be active. But mm -hmm. it's interesting that they quote quite moderately potent compound. You know, it's hard mm -hmm. to see quite why. Yeah, and all they did was this hepcidin study. I mean, they didn't do much in that patent with the compound. So, yeah. mm. these are some of the hard lessons we learned. Because the earlier compound, they had an earlier series that was quite potent, and we actually have made that, and that was quite active, actually. So, it's interesting. It's quite, it's quite surprising for a company like that to, to publish yeah, patents yeah, on sure. compounds that aren't active. <laughs> yeah, that's going <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. So if not, thanks again, and we look forward to some more updates next month, all right, particularly on the in vivo studies. And so thanks, everyone, for some excellent updates. OK, goodbye, and see you around next month. Thank thanks, you. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.